Hey everyone, it's the Doom Dog. You know, I do not want to pigeonhole myself as being an FPS only guy. That's one of the reasons why I decided to do games such as Ratchet and Clank and the Final Fantasy VII Remake. But I will be damned if I don't love a good first person shooter. With that in mind, we're taking a look at another first person shooter. Today we are looking at Metro 2033. Join me as we visit the Metro Tunnels under Moscow. The story of Metro 2033's development really starts with two things. Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, and the book Metro 2033 by Dmitry Glukovsky. I probably butchered that name. Stalker received a lot of critical acclaim from fans and critics alike. And it was something of a cult hit, despite being a buggy mess. The world the game created and the atmosphere received a ton of much-deserved praise. Not all was well at GSC Gameworks, though. The company had financial troubles, and the working conditions were generally not very good to the point where a whole bunch of people working there wanted to break off from the main team after the game was released, they broke off and formed their own company called 4A Games. They set out to work on their own game that would eventually become Metro 2033. I doubt I need to point out the strong similarities between the two games, but the earliest build that the team showed off was much more similar to Stalker than the final product was. It was so similar, in fact, that GSC Game World accused 4A games of stealing their engine. I do not know if this is true, but I do know that the early build of Metro did leak, and the two games shared a ton of assets at the time. GSC Game World might have had a point. By the time they came out with their accusations, however, Metro 2033 was much further along in development. A lot of the reused assets from Stalker and its engine had been replaced, and the engine had been touched up to the point where they did not really resemble each other. It may have had a point. They brought it up too late for it to actually matter. We wound up with two series out of it, so it's better off this way for the rest of us. The other major aspect of this game's development is the novel Metro 2033 by Dmitry Glukovsky. When Dmitry was in college, he took the subway train four hours per day, and he took notice in the way it was built. If you do not know, the Soviet Union built their metros to withstand a nuclear blast. Dmitry took note of this and decided that it would be a great setting for a post-apocalyptic story. What is interesting is that he did not even have a publisher for the novel when 4A Games first approached him. He was having trouble finding a publisher for his novel, and he was publishing chapters of it online that were getting a lot of readers. It got the attention of 4A Games, and they thought it would be the perfect story to adapt for their shooter set in a post-apocalyptic world. Before we really begin to look at the narrative, though, I have not read the book. I would like to, but I haven't read it. I cannot take the narrative of the game and the story in the novel to see how similar they are to each other. I have heard that it does stick pretty closely to the book, but I do not know. I will have to judge the video game's narrative as is. With that being said, shall we begin? Let's take a dive into the metro tunnels below Moscow and see what Metro 2033 has in store for us. Metro 2033 stars a character named Artyom. He was born in Moscow, but he did not live there long enough to have any memory of it. The world was destroyed in the flames of war, and the people of Russia survived by retreating into the metro tunnels under the city. Thanks to the high levels of radiation on the surface, the tunnels were filled with mutant creatures. The people hope to one day return to the surface. The game takes place 20 years after the bombs fell. A new threat to humanity appeared seemingly out of nowhere. 
They were new creatures known simply as the Dark Ones. The game opens with RTM and a companion named Miller climbing up a ladder to head to the surface. Miller is unsure if their actions today will save the world or damn it, and he tells RTM to put his gas mask on before he goes up to the surface. Once on the surface, it is revealed that the destination is a tower off in the distance. A truck arrives while you are making your way towards the tower and a couple more people hop out of it. The group gets surrounded by mutants and all of you get attacked. Eventually, a large winged mutant swoops down and pulls the truck over. As your group seems to be getting overwhelmed, the game fades to black. The game flashes back in time to eight days earlier. Attacks on the metro station have been escalating recently. RTM recently celebrated his 20th birthday. A friend of his stepfather named Hunter is arriving back at the station and RTM is going to meet up with him. The Dark Ones do not kill outright. Their victims slowly die after encountering them. There is a knock at the door and it turns out to be Hunter. They let him in and he gives RTM a postcard for his wall that we saw earlier. The Dark Ones are different from other mutants. While the group is talking, alarms go off and mutants are headed toward the station. Everybody picks up a gun and RTM is given a six shooter to help fight them off. No Dark Ones were in the wave of mutants that attack the station. They are a new species. They are said to be the next evolution of mankind. During the attack, the Dark Ones had approached the rear of the station, and everyone that was defending that entrance is now dead. Hunter is going to do some recon, and he tells Artyom that if he is not back by morning, come to another station called Polis and look for him. Hunter believes the Dark Ones must be eliminated. The next day, Artyom wakes up to find that Hunter has not returned. He needs to find a way out of the station to make his way to Polis, where he will find a man named Miller and give him Hunter's dog tags. He joins the convoy that is bringing supplies to another station called Riga, and he plans to head out toward Polis after he arrives there. He stops by the armory and picks up weapons and supplies for the trip to Riga. The station has alliances with Riga, and it is Artyom's job to protect the convoy from mutants and raiders. Artyom has never left his station before. This trip does frighten him as such. Getting to Polis will not be an easy task, as RTM has a long way to travel through the tunnels filled with mutants and raiders alike. It will require him to travel through areas that are controlled by commies and Nazis both. The car eventually gets stopped and told that there is something blocking the rail ahead, and you need to take the service tunnel. While you are traveling through the side tunnel, an anomaly approaches and causes everyone in the cart to pass out. Artyom has some sort of vision of a Dark One approaching. It seems to kill a friend of his before getting gunned down. He wakes up to find others passed out on the cart under attack by mutants. Fight them off. Artyom eventually gets knocked off the cart and he has to head the rest of the way on foot. Once he reaches Briga, he finds the station is under lockdown. He needs to find a way to slip out of the station so he can head toward Polis. He will have to go alone. For now, the group is at the bar enjoying drinks and toasting Artyom and surviving the mutants and the anomaly. A child approaches him and tells him that someone is looking for him. He offers to lead Artyom to the man. Artyom sits down with Bourbon. He offers to help Artyom out of the metro station and offers to give you his AK when he arrives at his destination. He gives you some cash to go spend at the market. Go do that. Get yourself some filters and whatever else you might need and return to Bourbon. Follow the man and make your way back out of the station. Artyom is not sure if he can trust this man, but he needs to get out of Riga, and this is his only option. Artyom and Bourbon venture out of the station into the dark tunnels. They come across the bodies of caravanners, and Bourbon says they were killed by some raiders that roamed the tunnels. He says they must be nearby, and sure enough, the two encounter cans on strings, serving as a primitive warning to the raiders that something is approaching their hideout. 
carefully avoid them so as to not alert the raiders. Shortly after this, Artyom and Bourbon encounter the raider camp. They have to find a way through, which typically means fighting your way through. Artyom remarks that he was expecting to fight mutants in the tunnels, but he is surprised that he has to fight humans as well. This is a little naive, sure, but remember, he has never left his home station before. This is probably the first time he has encountered anything like this. On their way to the market station, they pass through something called the Lost Catacombs. In these, Artyom gets another vision of the Dark Ones. Bourbon starts freaking out, and Artyom helps him snap out of it. Bourbon says he heard a song that he never wants to hear again. He has no idea exactly what happened to him. Shortly after the pair arrive at Market Station, a group of mutants approach the station. Artyom and Bourbon must fight them off before they will be allowed into the station. After successfully doing so, the doors to market open and the guards recognize Bourbon. They pull him aside to speak with them privately, leaving Artyom alone with one of the guards. When they return, the two of you are let in the market. Bourbon owes some money to the people here. He does not want to stick around for too long. He gives Artyom more cash to go buy some supplies. He says to meet up with him after doing so. When Artyom returns to Bourbon, he is cutting a deal with the guards to open the gate and let the two of you out. Leaving the station sees the two of them climbing to the surface. Artyom is seeing the destroyed world for the very first time, and it leaves him with feelings of fear and sorrow. On the surface, Artyom sees another vision. This one is of the world before the war. He sees a playground with children playing on it. I wonder if this is meant to be a Terminator 2 reference. Honestly, I cannot say for sure. After trekking across the surface for a while, the pair make their way back into the tunnels below. Dry Station is coming up and there is a group of bandits ahead. He says he has friends there and he tells Artyom to stay back in the vents while he goes on ahead to get them. He leaves his stuff with you and climbs out. They capture him and Artyom is left with no choice but to rescue him. Gee, who could have seen that coming? Artyom grabs Bourbon's stuff and heads out to rescue Bourbon. He needs to find a way through the bandit encampment to where they are holding Bourbon. He eventually finds his way back to the back of the place where they are interrogating Bourbon. Artyom sadly arrives just in time to see them kill Bourbon. Another man named Khan drops out of the vent and takes out the rest of the raiders before they can do the same to Artyom. What a big coincidence. The moment you lose one accomplice, another drops out of the vents. Awfully convenient for the storytelling perspective, but it is handy for the player. Khan says he can you cannot stay here because the friends of the bandits that you just killed will be coming to try to avenge them. He suggests that you come with him as he travels through the tunnels. Artyom agrees. While he regrets Bourbon's death, Khan insists that it is not his fault. He is right, Artyom did everything he could to try to save the man. Sometimes things just do not go your way. The two of them find their way to a rail car, which will surely speed up the rate of travel. They eventually come across another station called Gerst Station, a fitting name for a station that is constantly under attack. Artyom is tasked with using explosives to close the tunnels that the mutants are coming from. The team that attempted this previously died in their attempt. After accomplishing his goal and returning to Khan, the man says that this is where you two have to part ways. He is needed at Curse Station, so he decides to stay here for a while. He says you need to take a detour to get to Polis. Artyom will have to go through tunnels controlled by the commies and the Nazis who are at war with each other. It will be dangerous. He says Artyom needs to make his way to an independent station where the weapons are made called Smithy. He is to look for a man named Andrew the Blacksmith. He, he escorts you to a panel on the floor. He lifts it up for you, and the two of you part ways. Artyom hops down into it. 
Our team arrives at the station and they stop to check him before they let him enter. The Reds have taken over control of the station for the time being. RTM winds up wandering into the wrong area and is spotted by the commies. They are interrogating a man and they immediately decide to arrest RTM too. The man fights against them and him and RTM make a break for it. RTM eventually gets pulled aside into a room out of sight of the commies. The man he escaped with turns out to be the man that he was looking for, Andrew the Blacksmith. Him and his companions give RTM a disguise as they plan to sneak him past the front lines by hiding him in a rail cart. After putting on the disguise, they lead him to a hole just below the tracks. They drive the cart over him, and he climbs up into the compartments. The cart takes off, and they wish him good luck. Eventually, the cart hits something, and it causes Artyom to fall out. He must make the rest of the way through the fighting factions on foot. After fighting through the two warring factions, Artyom sneaks through a hallway and gets pulled through the, another door. This time he was pulled through by a group of Nazis who think he is a commie spy. As they are discussing what to do with him, another party sneaks up behind them and kills the Nazis. Artyom shows this new group hunters tags. As luck would have it, they recognize the tags and offer to take him with them. They get to an armored rail car and have Artyom take the mounted gun. The group comes across a roadblock. The people manning the roadblock do not buy their story and fire at you. They drive off to make their escape while Artyom fires back. After escaping, you get overwhelmed by mutants and they take your current companion. Artyom is left to wander the tunnels alone again. Artyom needs to make his way to another station called Black Station. He comes across a group of people in the tunnels and they call him over to them. They send him to talk to the captain in charge of the group and they are holding off waves of mutants while the station is being evacuated. They ask Artyom for his help. He agrees. An anomaly approaches the group, and Artyom passes out. When he comes to, mutants are attacking the station. Help fend them off until another anomaly crashes into the station entrance, causing Artyom to pass out once again. When he wakes up again, he finds that the soldiers he has been fighting with are now dead. Artyom heads into the station where he finds the captain barely clinging to life. A lot of mutants broke through after Artyom passed out. It's a wonder he lived through this. Did the mutants see him unconscious and decide that he was dead or something? The captain gives RTM an emergency message to deliver to Polis. Message in hand, RTM makes his way through the station now overrun with the bodies of the dead and the mutants that killed them. After he makes his way through the station, RTM's thoughts turn back home. Will his home station fall to a similar fate? He spots a child over the body of his uncle, not understanding what happened to his uncle. The kid is afraid of Artyom at first, but Artyom agrees to escort the child to safety. You eventually come across his parents at the entrance to the next station, trying to make their way out to look for the kid. The kid gets off of Artyom's shoulders and runs to his mother the moment he sees her. She thanks him and offers him some cash. Artyom will need to make his way across the surface again, and he will have no help this time. The moment he steps out... On the surface, he encounters some Nazi patrols and must deal with them before he can move on. The next station has been overrun by fascists. He runs into a man named Ullman who gives him a silenced weapon to help him fight his way through the station. He has to sneak and fight his way through on his own, though. After fighting his way through, he comes across another rail car. Ullman is there as well, and he has RTM hop in. The two of them drive to the next station, which turns out to be Polis. He finally made it. The guards at Polis recognize Ullman, and they decide to let RTM in based on this. He is finally here to find Miller and deliver the message that he was given. RTM leaves his gear at the entrance, 
and gets new clothes. They promise to give him his clothes back when he is ready to leave. Olbin heads off to find Miller while RTM delivers the message that he was given. An emergency session of the council is called, but they ultimately decide not to help RTM with his home station. Miller, however, still wants to help and he decides that he and his rangers will do this themselves. Miller hatches a plan to locate an old missile base called D-6 in hopes that it still has missiles that can be used to strike the Dark Ones. The only problem is that he does not know where D-6 is. There is a great library on the surface, however, and he is hoping information on the base is there, including its location. RTM heads to the surface with Miller and the two of them split up with plans to meet up at the library. RTM meets back up with Miller at the entrance to the library. You need to enter the building and find the military archives. The info you seek should be there. It should be beneath the main library. Inside, a demon swoops in and picks up one of your companions and flies away. He's found still alive but injured later on. Miller needs to take him back to Polis if he hopes to survive, so RTM needs to search the library alone from here on out. He promises he will come back as quickly as he can. At one point while exploring the library, one of the creatures corners RTM when a demon swoops in and attacks it, allowing RTM to get away. Another climbs up on the elevator after RTM steps into it. Causing it to crash down below, it dies, but RTM survives. He reaches the military archive, and after searching for info on D6 for a while, he comes across a drawer labeled D6 and pulls the book inside of it out. This is exactly what you came for. RTM makes his way back out of the library, and when he gets back outside, he is attacked by a creature. A truck comes in and runs the thing over. Miller is the driver, and he offers RTM a lift back to the church that serves as the ranger's headquarters on the surface. It's called Sparta. The book does not contain too much information on D6, but it gives you its location. This is your next destination. RTM heads out with the rangers as they pile into a rail car and head toward D6. While on his way there, RTM has another vision of the Dark Ones. The others eventually wake him back up, snapping him out of it. The car reaches a block of the tunnel, and you need to get out of it and lift the gate up. Get on the mounted flamethrower and fend off the mutants while this is done. Afterwards, an anomaly approaches. The group narrowly escapes it to the other side of the gate. They all split into teams to find their way through the tunnels to D6. The way forward is blocked. RTM is tasked with finding a way through. After doing so, he meets back up with the rest of the group. One member of the group is killed by a mutant, and a subway tram pulls up. No one is on it, but it is said to take you to D6. D6 is a dangerous place, so the group has to put on their gas mask. In order to make it through, the group arrives at the long abandoned missile base. RTM is given a task of finding and booting up the auxiliary power for the ventilation system. His companions walk him through it, shouting out instructions as he follows until he gets it back up and running. Once it is, the group can take the masks off again. He returns to the rest of the group as they hop on a cart to descend down into D6. RTM powers up a cart that pushes through a huge steel door, allowing them access to a control room. Upon entering the control room, the power comes on. They find some working missiles still there, and the power goes back off. The reactor that is powering this place below is currently deactivated. You need to get it back up and running. And I will give you one guess as to who is going to do this. There's an elevator leading down to it and they say there is just enough power to power it if they turn everything else on. Make your way down. While you're headed toward the elevator, RTM encounters strange biomasses that attack you and blow up when killed. As you are getting onto the elevator, you hear the others in the control room over the intercom system. 
Wait, the game just said we had to shut down the power for everything else to make the elevator work. Why are they able to use the elevator if this is the case? Or is this a figure of speech meaning most things and we're not supposed to take it literally? They are instructed to head down to the control room for the reactor and they will tell you what to do next. There is a huge biomass on the reactor itself. Are we absolutely sure that it will run with this thing covering it? If it will, what are the odds that the mods are going to make it stronger? It seems like something we should be deeply concerned about. For now, Artyom and Miller enter the control room for the reactor and start powering it up. The old used up rods are a problem though. They need to be pulled if this thing is going to run again. And Artyom is the one to do it. You control a crane here, positioning yourself above the rods and pulling it up. With each rod you pull, the reactor powers up more and the tentacle of a biomass is pulled off, injuring it and angering it. It attacks both Artyom and Miller to try to stop them, but get all the rods pulled and you will achieve full power for the reactor and the missile base. Head back down to meet the group with Miller. Miller says that you will need to come back at some point to deal with the biomass on the reactor. Yeah, no shit. It's probably feeding off the radiation and getting larger and more powerful over time. It will probably wind up presenting a much larger threat if that is allowed to continue. You have to deal with one problem at a time though. And the Dark Ones have been damning your people to a slow and painful death. Artyom meets up with Ullman and the rest of the group. He picks up the guidance system for the missiles. Two will stay behind to launch the missiles while everyone else goes up to the surface to head for the tower and use the guidance system. This will allow you to aim the missiles. The game flashes to the battle that it faded out at the beginning. Miller chases off the demon. Follow him and head for the tower. Reach the tower, enter the elevator to discover that it does not work. Color be shocked. Artyom and Miller climb up to the top of the elevator and Miller does something, I do not know what, that gets it to start going up. The two of them hop down into the elevator and ride it up as far as it will go. At the top, Artyom is separated from Miller as he slips and falls to a floor below. He has to find his way back to Miller. Artyom joins up with Miller later on. As Miller is talking to Ullman, a demon swoops down and attacks him. Before it can finish Miller off, Artyom pulls out his gun and shoots it. He kills it, but Miller is badly injured, leaving Artyom to climb the rest of the way on his own. The Dark Ones try to make contact with Artyom while Ullman is also trying to make contact with him. The Dark Ones have worked out what Artyom is doing, and as you can imagine, they are not happy about it. Artyom sets up the guidance system to destroy the Dark Ones, and they place him on one final vision. In this vision, they are desperately trying to stop Artyom. You have to run from them until you wind up cornered. One of the Dark Ones approaches you and you are left with no choice but to kill him. When Artyom comes back to reality, there is a dead Dark One right in front of him. At this point, you may be given a choice that you may not even be aware of. The game has two different endings. The one I got for this playthrough was letting the bombs fall. They strike down on the Dark One's home and it wipes them out. Artyom sits down and watches as this happens. Artyom knows he won the war with the Dark Ones, but he wonders what it will cost in the long run. That's it. That's all Metro 2033. I like this ending. I like the sending a lot. The idea of it is that Artyom realizes the Dark Ones are not trying to kill off humanity. 
Instead, they are trying to communicate with them, and he is the first one to be able to make contact with them and live. He realizes this after he has set up a guidance system, however, and it is too late for him to save the Dark Ones. What I really like is that it really makes you think. On the surface level, the actions of RTM and the others do not seem justified, but when you think about it beyond a surface level, you realize that there is a lot more nuance than just that. Do you remember back at the beginning of the game? You went through a hospital and saw firsthand what the Dark Ones have done to people. Men losing their mind and dying extremely painful and slow deaths. In the face of what's happening to your loved ones, you would be frightened too. It's a natural reaction. The Rangers see a problem. The Dark Ones killing a lot of people in this way and they decide to defend humanity from this. No one besides Artyom has made contact with them and lived. And he doesn't even understand what is happening. It is not hard to argue that humanity is acting in self-defense here. They have no way of knowing that the Dark Ones are not intentionally harming humanity. Whether humanity's actions are justified or not is very debatable, and I love this about this game. Beyond that, there are a lot of other things that I love about this game and its storytelling. So for the most part, it takes after Half-Life and its storytelling. Most of the game's story is told with it never leaving the first-person perspective. You see the world and its characters through RTM's eyes. It can immerse you in its world just as much here as it does in Half-Life. The real star of the show, however, is the world itself. When you play this game, take time to wander around in the different stations and see how each one works. There is so much detail packed into how these societies operate, and it is so fascinating. For example, the widely accepted currency is military-grade ammo. This makes sense because after the war it would become a more rare commodity. It has real value. As such, it works just fine as this universe's currency. Beyond that, you will see things like markets where things are bought and sold, people hanging out at places like bars and eating and drinking, farms where stock animals such as pigs are kept for meat and numerous mushrooms used to create food and drink. There is a lot of depth when you take the time to look around and work out how the world works. It is fascinating. This game is worth your time, at the very least, based on this alone. Having said that, the storytelling is not without its flaws. First off, this game does not stick strictly to the first-person perspective like Half-Life does. It does have actual cutscenes, at least in the original version of the game. Some people will not mind this, I didn't, but it can be immersion breaking for others. I get that. I understand how and why it can break immersion, but I would not say these cutscenes are necessarily bad on their own. The biggest problem, however, is the cast of characters just are not that interesting or memorable. RTM is not a silent protagonist. He does not talk in cutscenes, but he will talk a lot during the game's loading screens. This is a strange choice. It feels like it gives him enough personality that it makes it harder for players to fit into his shoes, which is the whole point of a silent protagonist. It's a very strange choice. He does not have enough personality to be truly memorable and to stand out, but he has enough to make it harder to slip into his shoes and see yourself in his role. The rest of the characters are pretty forgettable as well. They do not move or change as people, and they have very little personality for you to latch on to. If you are not getting into the world itself, you may find it harder to get into this game as a result. I will discuss this more when we get to the audio section, but the voice acting does this game no favors. 
I do like the story as a whole. It is a far cry from perfect as is the game as a whole, really, but the story that is here is interesting. Like I said earlier, the real star of the show here is the world. I intentionally left a number of things out of this critique because the game is best experienced when you play it yourself and really absorb yourself into the world and its atmosphere. Despite its flaws, these and the ending make it a story worth experiencing. Enough about the story. How does it look? This game is a 7th generation game. A lot of games from the first HD era have held up quite well over time, far better than any generation before it. It was originally released on the Xbox 360 and the PC. You have been looking at the PC release of this game the entire time. This game is no exception to this, for the most part. There is a hell of a lot to like graphically here, and it does stand out quite well for a number of reasons. Let's talk about them. Games from this generation were pushing higher resolutions than ever before, and they were capable of pushing more polygons than ever before. The standard resolution for consoles, however, was 720p. It is a far cry from modern consoles can push. The textures are smaller than what you can do now as well. This does show in some aspects of this game, especially when you are looking at the various character models in it. Do not get me wrong, the mutants look fine. They are not real-life creatures, so they are far less susceptible to the fake plasticky look that humans would be. They hold up just fine. It is the humans that look off by modern standards. They are certainly the most dated aspect of this game's presentation. Do not get me wrong, they do not look bad by any means, but their skin has this uncanny fake look to them that can just kind of throw you off at first. This is just the result of it being old and the character models being better nowadays. Having said that, the environments that you find yourself in are absolutely gorgeous. There is a lot of detail packed into them, and there is a surprising amount of variation in them between the different metros for it to all be tunnels under the city. The outdoor areas look even better. The fog and freeze effects on the visor of your gas mask are excellent. The weather effects, the thick ice, and the snow all over the ground sell the outdoor environments as a winter hellscape. It is very impressive work. There is something to be said for excellent art design as well. Take a look at all the weapons in this game. Take time to look at the various vendors and you will note that they all have a handcrafted and built from scraps look to them. They all genuinely look like something that you might build after a nuclear war chases everyone underground and you're left with severely limited supplies of what can be used to build weapons. It is such a cool touch and it lends itself to unique looking weapon designs. Beyond that, the design of the tunnels themselves are dark and moody and super atmospheric. Some of the best moments in this game are crawling through the tunnels slowly and listening to mutants when the only light source nearby are bioluminescent mushrooms. It is really fucking cool and it gives this game one of the most unique looks and vibes of any post-apocalyptic game you will ever play. The inspiration from games like Fallout and Stalker may be obvious, but it carves out its own unique identity. The most standout thing about this game's visual presentation has to be its lighting, though. 
The way this game is lit is absolutely amazing. It has inky black shadows and it is often very dark and dimly lit only by a fire nearby or mushrooms or something along those lines. The way your flashlight moves across objects in the environment and cast shadows is very impressive, especially for the time. I can only imagine how amazing this game would look if it had ray tracing, because what is here is already simply stunning. There is one thing I want to gripe about with this game, however, and it is the way in which it is optimized. Do not get me wrong, hitting a consistent 60 is not that hard in this game, nor should it be given how old this game is, but I had a bitch and a half of a time just trying to record this game. I thought I could just boot it up and record with OBS and it would be fine. When I tried this, however, the recording itself kept having frame rate stutter. Mind you, I was not seeing these stutters appear in the actual game, but I definitely was in the recording when the action got heavy. I decided to record some test footage and monitor the system performance. Look how hard this game hammers my GPU. Why does it do this? It makes no sense. This should not be happening. This screams that this game is very poorly optimized. And it is. I feel like I need to get out my fucking soapbox and rant about this for a bit. So that is exactly what I am going to do. If you happen to be watching this around the time that I am uploading it, you are probably very aware that bad PC ports have been all too common recently. Games are poorly optimized. They are glitchy and they run poorly way more often than they should. Is it too much to fucking ask that devs take the time to optimize their games? Its software does it well. Why can't anyone else take time to do it well if my hardware exceeds the recommended specs for your game i should not have trouble rewinding it ever at all what i'm saying is optimize your fucking games devs there is one more thing to of note about this game's graphics and presentation while this is not known for being a janky mess, or slav jank as Sivy would say, there are still elements of this present in this game. It is not glitch free. Watch as Archim and his companions share drinks at this bar, the glass glitches out pretty bad. It is not a huge deal, but it is not the only glitch that I came across. It can be immersion breaking when things like this happen. How does it sound then? Sadly, I cannot be quite as positive about the audio as I can about the graphical presentation. There are certain positive aspects to this game's audio presentation. It definitely has its highlights. Unfortunately, the audio is not consistent. It is the very definition of a mixed bag as there are certainly some low points to the sound design in this game. What do I mean? Well, let's talk about the good aspects first. The atmosphere in this game is every single bit as good as it is in the Stalker franchise. If you have played those games, you know that is high praise. When the game is presenting a creepy and foreboding atmosphere, it is at its absolute best with its audio. The environmental effects are great, the grunts and growls of the mutants are genuinely creepy, and the silence of the tunnels is unnerving. There are a lot of little touches that you may not even notice at first. If you take off the gas mask in an area where you need one, RTM will start to choke. When you are wearing your gas mask, you constantly hear his breathing. It will become more labored as the filter wears out over time. You will hear footsteps echoing in the darkness of the tunnel and growls coming from enemies that is too dark to see yet. 
All of these things add more to the game's atmospheric audio presentation, and it is all extremely well done. There are other aspects of the game's audio, however, that are not good. Listen to these gunshot sounds. Do those sound like stock audio to you? Yeah, they are, and it is a bit distracting. Weapons do not have the power behind them that they need, and it takes away from the feeling of firing them as a result. The fact that the gun audio is stock is a problem. You have heard it so many times in other media that it is just distracting. The voice acting is... As previously mentioned, not great. It would seem that for every decent performance in this game, there is also one that sounds boring and uninterested. This frequently harms the game's characters because there is no personality in the way that a lot of the characters in the game speak. A game, movie, or show's line delivery can lend a lot of life to a character's and it can lift a character from decent to something more. It can make an average character more memorable than they should be. This is not the case here, however, as line delivery falls flat. Take Artyom, for example. As I previously mentioned, he is silent during cutscenes and gameplay, but he does speak a lot during the loading screens. It comes across as him reading diary entries, but the voice actor just sounds bored when he's reading these lines. Have a listen. The tunnel grew colder. Miller and I were close to the surface now. Soon, we'd climb up into the howling wind to find our way through whatever nightmares were waiting there. My long journey was nearly at the end. But would I have the courage, the will, to see it through? See how the line delivery is just flat? This is a problem that plagues a lot of the characters in this game, sadly. All in all, the audio is very much a mixed bag. When it is being atmospheric, it is at its best, it does a job wonderfully. The environmental sound effects in the stations and the tunnels are, is generally excellent. It is a shame, then, that the gun audio seems to be taken from stock libraries and the voice acting leaves a lot to be desired. While this should not be a deal breaker, it is one of this game's flaws. Make no mistake, this game is most definitely flawed. This brings us to the gameplay. How does Metro 2033 play? At first glance, it seems like a fairly straightforward first-person shooter outside of the metros themselves. You spend a lot of time in combat. You will either be firing at mutants or other humans. The humans are exactly what you would expect out of them, but the mutants are a bit more unique. They tend to charge at you, but the way they move is often erratic. They tend to be rather quick as well, it can make them a little harder to hit. This does vary the combat between the two though, so that is nice. This game does have turret sections as well. These see you manning a turret and using it to gun down either mutants or other humans. Most of these are RTM taking up a gun on a vehicle of some kind and using it to keep enemies at bay as you travel along the rails. This does have the occasional stationary turret as well, though. These are often optional, though. Unlike the ones on the vehicles, you do not have to use these if you do not want to. When not engaged in combat, you will spend a lot of time following your companions and listening to them talk. Because Artyom is a silent protagonist, Outside of the loading screens, he does not say anything back. You will spend a hell of a lot of time following people and listening to them talk in between combat sections in the tunnels. Depending upon your personal taste, you may be fine with this, or it may drive you nuts. It can be a little excessive. It does not bother me, but I still have to admit it would help more if the characters were more interesting. 
you will also spend a fair amount of time going into areas just off the path to find loot and you will be pulling it out of lockers and off shelves. There will be plenty of ammo on corpses as well, so make sure you take the time to loot all of these to keep yourself properly equipped. If you are not careful, you will find yourself exploring and you will miss important dialogue as a direct result. This happened to me and it took me a while to figure out exactly what I was supposed to do next. It can be annoying when this happens, so do be careful. Truthfully, this game plays a hell of a lot like Half-Life. You will spend a lot of time with the first person as the story is being delivered. There are numerous set pieces you will play through, and it is linear. You would expect such a thing, given that you are exploring tunnels underneath the ruins of the city. It does not play out 100% like Half-Life, though, as it does have the occasional proper cutscene. If you are going to go for the immersion of Half-Life, this is a strange decision. Beyond this, there are some things about this game that do separate it from a typical straightforward shooters. The first of these is your flashlight. Do not get me wrong, flashlights are common in these games, but this game has a flashlight that slowly dies over time and you need to keep your battery charged to make sure it keeps working. You will need to too because the tunnels can be very dark. Make sure you pull out your charger to check the charge and to recharge. It is a simple mechanic, but it is a very cool addition that adds to the immersion of this world. There are quite a few areas in this game where you will need a gas mask as well. The surface is the main place where you will need it, but uh, but it is not the only one. The air in these places is poisonous to breathe. RTM will start to choke if you do not put on your gas mask when you enter them. You can put it on and pull it off with the simple press of a button. Did you think the gas mask mechanic would be that simple? Of course it isn't. You must have filters or the gas mask will stop working. You can find these at various places in the underground or on sale at the various stations. The way it works is you will just hit the right button and RTM will replace the filters on his current mask. Make sure you have plenty of these before going to the surface and pay attention to the watch on your arm. It tells you how much you have left before your filter needs to be replaced. Your gas mask can also become damaged over time. This can limit your visibility through its visor and it can eventually develop a hole in it. If this happens to you, your gas mask is broken and you need to replace it. There are numerous bodies all over the game with replacement gas masks, but you can only pick them up if they are less damaged than your current gas mask. Keep an eye out for these if your mask does take damage and replace it with a new one as necessary. When I first played this game back on the Xbox 360, I ran into a glitch that eventually resulted in me not being able to progress further into the game. For one reason or another, I was not able to remove my gas mask. I do not know if this was patched out of any version of the game or not, but I did not seem to run into this glitch on my playthrough of this game on PC. Still, it is something that you should probably keep in mind. If this happens to you, loading an earlier save point should fix the problem. When you are in the metro stations, you will be able to explore a bit. You can listen to numerous conversations between people on the stations, and that really helps bring it to life. You can see numerous details that explain how society functions in these stations, and you can spend your time shopping. There are numerous items that you can buy at each metro. 
you can pick up additional ammo, filters, and grenades, but you can also purchase new guns. They will come with a variety of upgrades that can make them better than your current one. Perhaps they are silenced or they are more stabilized for more accurate shooting, among other things. This game really lets you pick your loadouts as you go through with your purchase. The in-game currency is military-grade ammo. Keep an eye out as you are exploring this game for loot, and be sure to pick it up when you see it. Do be careful with it, though. You can put this ammo into your weapon and waste it killing enemies. They are more powerful than your standard ammo, but I cannot think of any reason why you would want to shoot your currency at enemies. Be careful not to do this by mistake, because it will eat through it rather quickly. I accidentally did this once. Metro 2033 has a morality system as well. The way it works is that actions you take over the course of the game give you karma points. Sometimes it makes sense. If you give a bolt to a beggar, for instance, you gain karma points. This makes sense, right? Do good deeds and you will be rewarded. It is not quite that simple, though, because the system has a couple of glaring flaws. The first of these is that there's no real way for you to tell how many you have. Karma points determine your ability to get the alternative ending. You are not told how many you have or how many you need to achieve this. It is fully possible to get enough karma points to get the alternate ending and you just miss it because the game simply never made you aware of it in the first place. The second problem with this karma system is that it makes absolutely no sense at times. The game will give you karma points for random arbitrary things that you would never think to do unless you know well ahead of time that you need to do it to get the other ending. Take this for example. Toward the beginning of the game, RTM wakes up in his room as he sets off on his journey. He has a guitar sitting in his room. You can interact with the guitar and strum it. Karma is tied to this for some reason. That's right, you get good karma points for playing your guitar. How on earth does this make any sense? This game does have a few other problems as well. There is a section where you are traveling with a kid on your shoulders. It makes sense from a realism standpoint that this would affect your movement, but from a video game standpoint, it feels like your movement is suddenly slower and more sluggish. It can feel like the game is glitching out like, or like the frame rate is tanking or something. This is definitely one design choice that I was not a particularly big fan of. It is not a deal breaker, but be aware of that. When you reach this point, your control will be affected. It is not the game glitching out, it is on purpose. The game does have a fairly basic stealth system, but I'm going to be real with you. The stealth in this game flat out sucks. It works like this. You can blow out numerous light sources to darken areas and try to hide in them. You may sneak around your enemies and use items such as throwing knives to silently take them down. This would be great if you had the opportunity to get away from them when you get spotted. But it has nothing like that. When your enemies spot you, everyone else is alerted and they all know where you are. It is not fun. It is annoying to play through and it resulted in me getting stuck for hours in this game more than once. Finally, the enemies can be very bullet spongy at times. This only affects the mutants, it does not really happen with the humans when you combine their bullet spongy nature with their erratic and quick movement it can make parts of this game an absolute slog to get through. This is definitely the case here in the library. 
These enemies take a lot of ammo to take down and it winds up not being fun to fight them. From a gameplay standpoint, this game is most assuredly quite flawed, but when the various elements mix together to work properly, it is a one-of-a-kind experience. It successfully mixes the linear event-driven Half-Life style of gameplay with the oppressive atmosphere of the Stalker games. When you are moving through the tunnels and gunning down humans or mutants in gunfights, it can be a lot of fun. When the light is dim and the atmosphere is heavy, and you can hear enemies off in the distance but cannot see them yet, it can be incredibly intense. However, when you are fighting bullet spongy enemies or having to engage with a stealth system, it can be more of an exercise in frustration than a fun experience. It is a shame that this happens to drag down the package as a whole, because when this game is at its best, it deserves the high praise that it is given. How much you will actually enjoy playing it depends upon how much tolerance you have for the things about that it does that can be annoying. What about replay value? As previously stated, this game does have two different endings. You will need to gather enough karma points to be able to get the alternate ending. You will either be given the opportunity to shoot the guidance system and to send it falling off a tower, or you won't. It does not tell you that you can do this. You have to figure it out on your own, but it does lend replay value, especially if the game just doesn't let you get that ending the first time. Beyond this, the game has a variety of weapons for you to combine and to work with as you fight its enemies. This gives you a number of ways to engage in combat. Do you want to go with a shotgun, a double barrel shotgun, a submachine gun, or a rifle that uses air to fire? The choice is up to you and it will affect how you play. It is fun to play through again and pick up different weapons at the different vendors. This game has plenty of replay value. Metro 2033 is a flawed game as I previously mentioned, but it is also an excellent one. The world it creates, the atmosphere it has, the intense gunfights and the wonderful lighting and the interesting story all combine to create a truly unique experience. I definitely highly recommend giving this game a try if you have not played it before. Metro 2033 is excellent. I have beaten it twice now, and I definitely have not beaten it for the last time. The version of Metro 2033 that you have been looking at this entire time is the original PC release from 2010. But there is a problem with it. You cannot buy this version of the game on Steam or GOG at all. It has been removed from all digital storefronts, which is sad. I like it when the original version and the newer version of games are both made available. This does not mean that there is zero way to play this game anymore. Let's talk about ports. When I first played this game, Back in the day, I did so on the only console port that the original game had. This is the Xbox 360 version of the game. It is definitely a scaled back version of the game, and it does not run all that well. It has a lot of frame rate problems, and it definitely never feels smooth. I cannot recommend it for the original experience if you are able to play the PC version instead. When it comes down to it, however, it is the most easily accessible version of the original game. The game received a remaster called Metro 2033 Redux on the PlayStation 4, the Xbox One, the PC, and the Switch. You are looking at the Xbox One version of it. It does not have an enhanced support for the Xbox One X, but it does run at a constant and smooth 60 FPS. It feels much smoother than the Xbox 360 port ever did, and it does look better too. This version of the game does make some changes 
that are more than just graphical enhancements, though. It has new voice acting, it has more ammo, the camera is always in first person, among other things. If you want the original experience, this is not it, but it is the easiest way to play the game nowadays. Here is the PC version of Metro 2033 Redux. The issue the original release had with high GPU usage are still present in this version of the game. It is, however, improved. You might still have some stutter if you are streaming or recording this version, though. But it is the best looking version of this game. It can run at higher resolutions than the Xbox One and PS4 version, which runs at 1920 by 1080. The system requirements are not super demanding. This is probably the best bet for playing the game nowadays for most of you. I know I sometimes talk about every single port of the game, but these are all the versions of this game that I own. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison between each of them. I do not have the Switch version, which runs at 30 FPS, or the PlayStation 4 version, which runs at 60 FPS as well. Both ports are supposed to be excellent ways to play the game, but I cannot vouch for them myself. Still, if you can get your hands on the original PC version, or any kind of Redux version, they are all fine ways to play. I would steer clear of the Xbox 360 port unless you want the original experience and just have no other options. Thank you for watching. This video took me longer to piece together than I would have liked, and I am sorry for that. Still, I do hope you enjoyed. I had a lot of fun revisiting this game. What do you think of Metro 2033, and which version do you prefer, the original or Redux? Let me know in the comments below. If you could give this video a like, that would help me out a lot as well. Share it, subscribe to this channel, and ring the bell just in case the bell actually does something. Talk to you later, everybody. Doomdog out.